I wanted to make my title a little bit more specific, actually, because immigration enforcement was a little bit unclear, as is this title, but I'll explain it further. Um, so, um, like Juanita said, I'm a master's student in geography at the University of British Columbia. Um, and today I'm presenting on some really quite preliminary research that I started that I'm hoping to pursue further with my um, master's thesis. So in this presentation, I'll discuss how emerging connections between the United States Border Patrol and um, distinct law enforcement agencies are bringing a national borderland into being at the northern United States border. And I'm taking the approach of um, feminist geopolitics. And so this field examines how, or one thing that this field examines is how national borders are delineated by practices of territoriality or spatial strategies of control. And this can range from legal structures of land or property tenure um, to social norms with indicate, which indicate characteristics of belonging um, to state violence used to enforce exclusions. And so I'll be arguing that in Northern Washington, new borders are being drawn through everyday exclusions most notably through the racialization and policing of Latinos who live in this region. Um, sorry. So, <laughs> this research project actually starts with my own misconceptions about the U.S.-Canada border. Um, so, before I began grad school, I was working at a nonprofit immigration law office in Seattle. Um, and I was mainly working with Spanish-speaking clients who had mostly come from Mexico and Central America. Um, and so I heard many stories about treacherous border crossings um, coming across the U.S.-Mexico border. But the first time one of these clients told me a story about being apprehended by the Border Patrol in northern Washington, where he resided, I was a little bit taken aback. And it took me <laughs> a little bit of back and forth to figure out which border we were talking about because it just, it didn't seem right because this is kind of how I imagine the border. Um, it's often referred to as the longest peaceful international border in the world. Um, the landscape of the border is punctuated by symbols of peace and familial relations. For example, at the major land border crossing between Western British Columbia and Western Washington is the International Peace, peace Arch Park. Um, and this arch here is inscribed with, with these words, brethren dwelling together in unity and children of a common mother. <laughs> so this, this sort of symbolism for me is what established what is this border like, um, peaceful. And so I want to make sure that practices of territoriality or securitization occurring at this borderland are not ignored behind these peaceful reputations that the border um, has claimed. So specifically, um, I'm looking into a particular area of northwestern Washington called the Olympic There on the kind of far upper left hand corner of that map, and in green is the Olympic National Park. Um, so this area is separated by Canada by the Strait of Juan de Fuca, by a waterway. Um, and the land holdings, about half of the peninsula is protected land, including the National Park. Um, and then there are also private land holdings. Um, there's small towns around the perimeter of the peninsula as well as indigenous land holdings. Um, and the resources of the forest in this area, which you can see in the picture on the right, um, which is actually me backpacking in the forest um, last summer with some friends, have drawn many visitors like myself and also many newcomers over the years who have settled in the peninsula. Um, in the early 1980s, hundreds of Mexicans and Central Americans um, who had been living in other parts of Washington were recruited to come work in the Olympic Peninsula in what's known as the floral greens industry. And so floral greens refers to certain leafy greens that are harvested from the forest and used um, for decorative purposes, for example, floral arrangements or Christmas wreaths. Um, and this, these leafy greens are also referred to as forest brush. Um, the most recent newcomers to the peninsula who have made their presence quite obvious um, is a 
kind of an exponential increase in the number of Customs and Border Protection agents. Um, just 10 years ago, there were three Border Patrol agents working at the headquarters in the peninsula. And <laughs> as of 2012, there were 42 agents, and a larger office is currently under construction. Um, in 2008, the Border Patrol began setting up highway checkpoints which w um, and also began inspecting vehicles on incoming ferries from Canada. In addition, officers began boarding domestic buses headed towards the interior of Washington. So not only has Customs and Border Protection as an agency arrived in force, but they're also moving further inland um, than ever before in Washington, um, creating a new border zone or perhaps a border land under their jurisdiction within 100 miles of the border. So I want to talk about one particular encounter um, out of many encounters that are occurring in the Olympic Peninsula due to this increased presence of Customs and Border Protection. Um, and it relates to language interpreters for other law enforcement agencies in the, in the region. Um, so in May 2011, a couple, um, Benjamin Roldan Salinas and Crisanta Ramos, had gone out to explore an area in the forest um, for leafy greens to harvest um, as part of this floral greens industry. And they were about 60 miles from the nearest water port of entry and 200 miles from the nearest land crossing to Canada. Um, so as they were loading up their van when they had finished for the day, um, a Forest Service officer drove by and then pulled over on the nearby highway to wait for them. And so when this couple drove by the officer on the highway, they noticed that he was on his phone. The officer then pulled them over and indicated that he needed to see their harvesting permits um, to show that they had the proper paperwork to be able to harvest um, leafy greens in this particular area. So Crisanta Ramos expected that they would receive a ticket for harvesting brush um, without the proper permit. Um, but minutes later, a Border Patrol agent arrived on the scene. Ramos was apprehended um, while Salinas jumped out of the van, ran down an incline, and his body was discovered um, having drowned in the river at the bottom of the incline three weeks later by search crews, which you can see pictured there on the bottom. So an important detail of this tragic incident is that the Forest Service officer called to request a Spanish language interpreter from Customs and Border Protection after he had observed the couple loading their vehicle with forest brush, but before having actually spoken to them. And this is in line with what immigrant rights advocates are observing all along the northern United States border. Um, within 100 miles of this border on the US side, people of color, immigrants, and religious minorities are profiled, harassed at church, repeatedly stop for minor traffic violations or pedestrian infractions and search without probable cause. And so the institutional kind of overlaps and entanglements that allow this to happen are, are complex and there's many of them, so I won't get into the details right now. Um, but kind of my, my um, reading of the situation is that um, with language interpretation, offered by Border Patrol, physical markers are drawing assumptions about language preference and thus about belonging. Um, racialized notions of belonging thus allow for extrapolated suspicions of criminality, whether it be suspicions of unauthorized immigration status or illicit use of the landscape through um, brush poaching. Okay, so um, considering incidents like this and encounters like this, um, I'm trying to, I'm grappling with um, Customs and Border Protection priorities in this region. So a lot of kind of diverse coalitions have come together to protest these practices um, by the Border Patrol, um, notably immigrant rights advocates and also some kind of libertarian-minded locals who are unhappy with so many law enforcement agencies in their area. Um, and they're asking the question, where do Border Patrol priorities 
um, fit into in our region? Is it to police threats that are coming from outside, from Canada, or is it to police some sort of internal threat that is already there? Um, so in some Department of Homeland Security documents, the northern border has been referred to as more vulnerable to terrorism than the southern border due to its um, kind of 4,000 miles long, expansive presence, um, largely unpoliced. Um, but the actual numbers of interdictions occurring at this border are just a fraction compared to those occurring at the southern border, not specifically referring to terrorism, but particularly of incoming unauthorized immigrants and smuggled narcotics. Um, in July 2011, the, the Customs and Border Protection headquarters in the Olympic Peninsula was publicly denounced by Border Patrol agent Christian Sanchez for mandating fraudulent overtime for payments for its agents. Um, Sanchez has said, quote, during our work shifts, other agents and I always talked about how coming to work was like the black hole, swallowing us up slowly with no purpose and no mission. So Sanchez believes that the office is overstaffed and as there's very little cross-border activity, um, it leaves agents to rove around further inland. Um, in contrast, um, an another Border Patrol agent in the, in the same office has described the threat presented by the Strait of Juan de Fuca, or the waterway up at the north. Um, he says, it's a blue highway. If you get in a boat, you can go anywhere you want. Um, and then he goes on to describe those red, the red marks for the highway. You can just hop on the highway there and continue on further inland into Washington. Um, so just from my pr preliminary research so far, I'm finding kind of this strange clash between priorities or the reasons that there are more officers present and the actual activities that they're carrying out. So in conclusion, um, I've focused on the Olympic Peninsula to illuminate the ways in which um, the northern United States border is under a process of territorial territorialization or the creation of a borderland for the sake of national security. And I've argued that a fortified border is materializing through increased border patrol presence and the intimate practice of policing through language interpretation centered on racialized notions of belonging. Um, and so this, this disturbing trend, in my opinion, illuminates the necessity to closely follow these materializations of national borders, which can be, sitter, be considered piecemeal in nature, but also a strategic expression of state power. Save the questions? Yeah, we'll save the questions to the end. I'll write it down. Thank you. Write it down. Yeah, write down your questions. We'll save them to the end so we can actually kind of engage in a conversation. Thank you, Lee. All right, our next uh, presenter is Miguel Diaz Barriga, who I'm sure many of you know and are familiar with his work. And he's going to be speaking on media representation of the U.S. Mexico border wall. <laughs> Uh, do you need a technical assistance? No, I just need to know how to make that full screen. Thank you, Walter. Dean Diaz. Okay, so I'm going to start by saying that, uh, repeating some of the stuff Dr. Magana spoke about, which is that we've had a policy of deterrence put in place since 1994 uh, through the construction of border walls, through various operations that has forced migrants into the deserted areas of the United States in order to cross the border, leading to roughly one death a day from dehydration and exposure. So we have a policy of exclusion and death, and it is a conscious government policy. And in fact, the architects of this program in 1994 have even come out and said, we didn't realize that people would still cross if we forced them into the desert. We thought it would stop them. Uh, so they even admit that they misjudged the impact of this strategy of deterrence. Now, within that, we have, does this work? I just turned it off. 
Okay, within that we have obviously in South Texas, we are sort of ground zero in this dynamic. We have the construction of the border wall. Here it is in Gran Geno, Texas, coming up right behind a small town. Uh, so we see the impacts of this policy of deterrence uh, immediately. We also see the impact in terms of how the media is representing this area. Not only this area, but obviously the whole border. And I want to put, sort of propose to you a theoretical scheme that we're working on, Margaret Dorsey and I, to think about this strategy of deterrence on citizenship or lived experience. And we've come up with the term necro-citizenship and that a politics of necro-citizenship is being applied to the, to the southern border and now increasingly to the northern border. The, this policy has three elements. First of all, that the state is more involved in a politics of exclusion, a politics that even permits the possibility of death. Secondly, it involves the deterritorialization of Mexican-American identity pushing border residents or viewing border residents as being outside of the U.S., as not being aligned with the U.S. mainstream. And thirdly, it puts a political premium, this might be the controversial part, on claims for citizenship. And oftentimes these claims are put forth through the willingness to die for one's country as the highest marker of citizenship. So, for example, the high rates of participation in the military from South Texas, the national claim that being willing to sacrifice your life, your body for the country makes you the fullest type of citizen. I think you would all recognize that that's part of our political discourse. So let me try and tie these sort of disparate things together for you. First of all, if you look at the national media, there's a large investment in the border. This image of the border is a war zone. You know, we have obvious things like National Geographic series, border wars. You look at national media, it's almost always about violence on the border. So there is a huge investment in this uh, representation of the border. Secondly, it's often described as desolate and as a moonscape. You know, we've, I've done analysis of various forms of media, and I think the Arizona border wins in the national imaginary of what the border looks like. And in fact, I've had a lot of visitors come to South Texas, and they're quite frankly confused by what they see. Shopping malls, Cirque du Soleil, all this other stuff, okay? Finally, the allegiance of border residents to the U.S. is questionable. Within the national media, Opposition to securitization, border walls, etc., is often pictured as or portrayed as being irrational. I'll give you an example. Thomas Tancredo came to Brownsville. He gave a series of hearings. He was one of the architects of the border wall policy. And when, a, when residents opposed the construction of the border wall, he simply said, we should just build it north of Brownsville. You all don't care about borders. So here he took, I think, a very reasonable opposition to the border wall and turned it into an act of betrayal and to the U.S. nation and irrationality. Sovereignty requires exclusion, even death. This is sort of the discourses of the Minutemen, okay? Finally, the highest form of citizenship, risk to death, in inverted form, and I'm going to discuss that very briefly in a second, okay? So these are the concrete examples, then, of this notion of necro-citizenship. So first, let's go through this very quickly. We have National Geographic Border Wars. This is from one of the front uh, images of their website. Again, this is National Geographic in one of their series on the border, oh, sorry, and the border wall. Again, desolate, no signs of life. This is from Time Magazine, double level uh, border wall. And they're even more interesting because they also have scenes of special op forces uh, working on the border. And again, all of this normalizes for the US imaginary death and violence 
on the border, okay? And makes, I, guess, I would argue, makes the general population accept this as the given for the border region. Another image from Time Magazine, and I want to make a very simple point here. In many of these uh, news reports, photo essays, you learn the names of the Border Patrol agents and what they're about and what they're doing, but you never learn anything about the immigrants. So we don't know who these individuals are, we don't know their names, we don't know why they're trying to cross that border. So it's a basic form of visual analysis, who gets biography, who does not. Okay, now just to sort of uh, put, put a larger context onto this, have any of you seen this map? Yes, okay. This comes from a report that was put together by General McCaffrey and General Scales that was commissioned by the uh, Agricultural Commissioner of the State of Texas, Todd Staples, which is kind of an interesting story right there. And they paid $80,000 for this report. This map actually got into the front page of the Monitor because it was presented by the Department of Public Safety at a set of public hearings about two weeks ago as sort of the given of how we should think about border violence, okay? A couple interesting things to mention here. It's a nice inversion of the traditional uh, notion of the open veins of Latin America, but totally recontextualized, obviously. And secondly, obviously, when you see a map like this, your first reaction has to be, my gosh, we have to secure this border, right? So it does its job fairly well, and it is circulating in, a, in an unquestioned manner throughout the media. Now, within that report, there are a very specific set of recommendations, and they're all militarized, okay? Command and control, more operations, better intelligence, better technologies, better ways of transmitting knowledge about successful strategies for detaining migrants, drug traffickers, et cetera. Interestingly enough, if you talk to local law enforcement, their priorities are exactly the opposite. They want anti-corruption measures for their own uh, individuals. They want more investigators. They don't want more military hardware. They don't want more National Guard troops. Uh, they don't even care much about these fancy command and control systems that the generals are proposing. So there is a real sort of opposition by local law enforcement to these national and even state measures that are now winning the day. This ties into, um, and I'm actually going to play this uh, clip very quickly. This is from Fox News. This ties into a larger construction of the lack of patriotism. These are respected generals. I believe we need and, to show them I, respect and allow them to answer the question. Okay. Well, let me ask my question again. Were you pay Never answered with yes or no. Well, okay, I'm asking you just I'm not going to answer a question with yes or no. I think what we're doing is okay, we're, thank you. We're, let me, we're, we're talking by each other. You were paid $80,000. said 23. Sorry about that. All right. Here we go. By members of Congress. The generals are hired to assess the danger at the U.S.-Mexico border. They were called to Congress to report their findings. Two Texas congressmen apparently didn't like the generals' assessment of the scene down at the border, so the congressmen went to their plan B and attacked the generals. I looked at your report. All I found was anecdotal evidence. Uh, I think if I would have done my dissertation or a, a report, I would have got an F. Don't you think anybody that would win this as a PhD would have gotten an F in their report? Well, not only have I done a PhD, I've done six books and about 300 scholarly articles, so I know a little bit about how to write. Uh, no, that's not how we did it. Wait, Washington, D.C. is at 23. We're here in Washington. Would you call Washington, D.C. a war zone? Well, uh, let me just a yes or no. The questions are never answered with yes or no. Well, okay, I'm asking you just. I'm not going to answer a question with yes or no. I think what we're doing is. Okay, we're, thank we're, you. Let me, we're, we're talking by each other. You were paid eighty thousand dollars as former military uh, taxpayer dollars to make this report. Is that correct? 
We had five people work four months on this report, and I assure you, if you know what he makes, and you I'm sorry, I assure you, General, without due respect, General, will the gentleman yield for a second? I, I do think these these are respected generals. I believe we need and, to show them I, respect and allow them to answer the question. Okay. Well, let me ask my question again. Were you paid eighty thousand dollars? Yes or no? Well, let me ask you: Are you suggesting that this report had political or monetary motivation? If you are, sir, that is a shameful let me, comment. Let me, let me say something, General. General, General. Because my General, dedication to this country was General, based on 32 years of service. General. Major General Bob Scales joins us, and let me be the first to apologize. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I have to say, like, you know, I'm really ashamed. I mean, I know, I know you very well. I know General McCaffrey very well. And you were called up to give information about your report, yeah. and um, I think it's scandalous the way you were treated. Well, uh, again, uh, Barry and I have served over 80 years in the military. We've both been shot at many times. And okay. So let's go down here. Okay. So. This brings together the themes that I want to talk about. First of all, uh, we didn't hear this at the beginning, but the ways in which this opposition is represented is unreasonable and irrational. The way the film editing is done is to make the congressman appear extremely rude. Uh, I'm sure they could have found other video clips that might have made his interaction with them look perhaps more reasonable to some viewers, although I don't think anything he said was unreasonable. Um, this, putting this in terms of the congressmen attacking the generals and their assessment and saying that they're Al-Qaeda-like is also part then of this deterritorialization strategy. So the Mexican-American Congress people from the border are now suspect, even to the point of becoming part of the terrorist groups. And finally, and I think this, this point just bears a, so much repeating and, and, and it's frustrating, uh, is the way in which knowledge about the border is produced with almost no knowledge of the border itself. And in this case, we even have Greta Van Susteren coming in and saying, well, you know, we don't really know what's going on down there, but we have an open border, we have a civil war going on, all those characterizations can be contested. And, you know, there's some latest terrorist things going on in Iran. And so all of these things become uh, joined in her mind. So to conclude, the pattern we see in media representations, and it's just not, this is just one example, there are many examples of this, is the normalization of the border as a war zone, the creation of Mexican Americans on the border as extra nationals, irrational with questionable allegiances, and the last part, what was it that made the general's report so viable? It was the fact that they were in the army, as he said, we'd been shot at, and that places them as higher status citizens than these border residents. And of course, we all know the irony there is, and this is where the part of the, where I use the word inversion, is that in fact, Mexican Americans on, at least in South Texas, are among the most patriot, uh, patriotic uh, U.S. citizens you can find. So, thank you. Does this microphone work? Yes. Um, uh, the clicker. Where'd it go? Oh, the clicker. Miguel, let's see your character. Miguel kidnapped the clicker. Okay. Um, so I... Yes. <laughs> so 
uh, I am a member of the media. <laughs> and um, I'll tell you what's going on in our minds when, these, uh, when we report border stories. Um, I have a sort of, uh, I guess, interesting background with reporting on the border. I used to work at the Monitor in McAllen. Um, I started writing about the border in, I think, 1998. I'm originally from San Diego, from the San Diego border. And then I left and went to work for the senator from this area, Senator Hinojosa. So I was in politics for five years uh, when the Secure Fence Act was passing and all that stuff was going on. So I was learning a lot. I mean, I wasn't in the federal politic, you know, level where Secure Fence Act and all that stuff was going on. But... Um, saw the trickle-down effect and learned a lot of at the Texas legislature about how the sausage gets made, <laughs> how bills get passed, and, uh, and also about political communication. And then I left politics and came back to the media, and uh, the border was a very different place. Um, I mean, I started writing about uh, this border in 98 and then came back to it in 2008. So, uh, and a lot had changed. Um, so when I started pre-9-11, and 9-11 to me is really when things really started to change here. Um, I wrote a lot about health, environment. There was a lot more room, I think, for different kinds of stories besides immigration and drug smuggling. Because you, ha you have a lot of what you call parachute journalism, where people come in from other parts of the country and they want to do a, a drug smuggling or an immigration story. And unfortunately, that's, you know, all that you see of the border. So um, pre-9-11, though, uh, Vicente Fox had just been uh, appointed president first in, you know, 71 years. The PRI had been in power all that time. And it was going to usher in this new era of binational co cooperation because he and Bush were friends and no knew each other. And everything was going to be so much better, and then boom, 9-11. And uh, pretty much we forgot all about Mexico, and the whole binational thing kind of went down. And uh, it was interesting. I was actually at the Hidalgo-Renosa border when the first uh, tower got hit. I was picking up a friend who was staying over in Reynosa. And uh, so we went back and watched the... the uh, other tower go down and uh, and I got a call from Time magazine in Atlanta and they're like get down to the border we need you what's going on down there and they had this interpretation of the border that it was like a big drawbridge that you could just pull it up like keep out the terrorists okay the borders closed because they had this narrative in Atlanta and New York that you could just shut down the border and press like a red button or something so they kept making me go down there you know is the border shut down yet uh, no People are coming across, people are going over, you know, life is continuing. And so it was kind of, that was like my first sort of experience with a national concept of, of the border from, from the media. And I think, I think Time magazine still did the story anyway where they said like the whole border shut down after 9-11, which wasn't the case, in, at least in this area. Um, so then... <laughs> Why are these men smiling? Um, we had the Secure Fence Act, which um, I think people here in the Valley knew a little bit about it. You know, I mean, I was working for the senator that represented this area, and we've been hearing about it. And, uh, but there wasn't any communication with communities down here. I don't think there was this big disconnect where... Um, you know, we're going to have a triple layer fence. And um, and I don't think they even realize that most of the land in Texas is private and that they that there's a, a let you know, that there's a levy and that there's they're going to have to build a mile from from the river. And so um, it was a big, big mess. So uh, I had just come out of I had just left politics and gone back to reporting and they, the media was starting to cover this story about the border fence a lot. Like, uh, people were coming in from other, you know, New York Times, and they were doing the story, and it was kind of, there just seemed to be something missing from the narrative. Like, they weren't really, 
I, I think because I had just come from policy making, I was like, wow, this is a really poorly crafted bill. <laughs> and where was the community, uh, um, you know, how did the community have any input into this? Uh, how did they decide where to build it, not to build it? I just had a lot of questions that I didn't feel like were being answered uh, in the news stories that I was seeing. And again, like what Miguel was saying, is I al always get this feeling that people feel that border communities are like second class citizens and that they should be willing to give up their land or whatever it takes to secure the rest of the nation and that they're somehow um, standing in the way of the rest of the country's security. So there was never any question of the like horrible, like constitutional, um, you know, they were just running over people's constitutional rights. I mean, it was pretty, it was really outrageous. Um, so uh, so these were some of the questions that I had. And I remember talking to my editor, uh, and, and I work at the Texas Observer now, by the way, I should have said that in the beginning. And it's a political cultural magazine in, in Austin. And we've been around since 1954. Uh, we're a progressive magazine. And um, I kind of just made it my beat to cover the border, because that's like my my passion and my interest and what I like to do. So I told my editor, look, I want to do a story on the border fence. And he said, oh my god, that story's been done a million times already. What, what would you have new to say about it? And I said, well, let me go down there and spend some time and talk to some people. So, uh, so my husband and I came down, and he's a photographer. And um, <coughs> I just started talking to people. And, um, and uh, one of the gentlemen I met uh, is uh, this gentleman from uh, Rangeno, Daniel, and um, he told me that they were going to build a fence through his house and his son's house next door, but they weren't going to build it in this property that uh, Mr. Hunt owned, who's a friend of President Bush's, and it was a basically an empty, empty piece of land that uh, was going to eventually be developed by Mr. Hunt at some point for Sherryland Plantation. So I started talking to people, and they're like, well, why is the fence going through my house, but it's not going through Riverbend Resort, or it's not going through Mr. Hunt's land? I can't get any answers from the government. Nobody's telling me anything. So I just started picking up these patterns, you know, like why, or who, who was even in charge of building the fence? Nobody knew. Um, so there were all these questions. So basically, I um, ended up... Uh, writing a story called Holes in the Wall, which was asking questions basically that all the landowners were asking, you know, like who's in charge of the fence? Who said it should be built here and not there? Um, why isn't the community having any sort of um, interaction with the, the government? Um, so I had a hard time getting answers. So I found out that finally that Boeing Corporation was in charge of building the fence, that they had gotten this multi-billion dollar contract um, in DC. And so they were outsourcing all this stuff. They had a group from Colorado who, who they, they started doing community meetings after they started getting pushback from you know the communities and, and negative stories. So they sent these people from Colorado down to make it look like they were taking the communities uh, comments, but really it was like, we're going to take your land whether you like it or not. You can make a comment that you don't like it, but it's not, the law's already been passed, and so there's no going back at this point. Um, so <coughs> it was very, uh, it was really outrageous. Um, and in the stories that I saw, there was very little questioning of the law, which I thought was interesting because if this were happening in o Ohio or somewhere else, or even along the Canadian border, I think people would be raising holy hell about it, you know? But for some reason down along here, with this perception that we're just being overrun and it's a war zone, that people just didn't have a problem with people's houses being mowed down to, to build a fence. That somehow, like, they weren't, people from border communities down here weren't quite full-fledged American citizens, as Miguel was pointing out. Um, so one thing that I thought was really great was a Texas Border Coalition, which was mayors and um, city leaders who got together. Um, and the mayor from Eagle Pass at the time, Chad Foster, was leading it. And uh, so they got up to Washington, D.C. to try to penetrate the 
DC bubble because the narrative about the border in, in DC is that yes, it is a, a desert wasteland and it's being overrun by illegal aliens and it's a war zone and it's really hard to change that narrative in DC and it's even hard to change it in Austin because a lot of people who aren't from the border communities portray it that way. And it's a very powerful image and it works really well also, by the way, for um, political campaigns. Uh, fear is a great motivator for, for voters. It brings people out to the ballot box. It gets people to support you. It makes it look like you're doing something. So especially conservatives really like to talk about the war zone and building a wall because it makes them look tough on, on crime. And um, so the Texas Border Coalition, I thought, did a pretty valiant effort of uh, trying to change that narrative because they were respected, you know, mayors, community leaders, business people, they couldn't be easily um, written off as some like wacko progressive liberal, you know, who wants open borders or something like that. Uh, so they did make a valiant effort. Um, and I mean, they did have some success. I mean, I think like at UT Brownsville, they were going to build a fence right through the campus. And uh, Dr. Garcia went to battle over that and they were able to make a sort of nice sort of um, looking fence. It doesn't look like a, a huge uh, Berlin Wall or anything, you know, because they, if they would have had it their way, if Homeland Security would have had it their way, it would have been a Berlin Wall going through the middle of campus, which was just totally ridiculous. Um, so, um, uh, militarization, um, since the the fence has gone up. The whole militarization thing has really taken off. Um, I mean, there was a, it's always been the case down here to a certain degree, but it's just sort of mushrooms since the Secure Fence Act. It's like, now we've got the fence. Let's put the turrets up and the machine guns and let's, you know, uh, and the moat. Um, so you hear a lot of, like, uh, uh, you hear a lot of uh, jargon, you know, the war on terror, War on terror, boots on the ground is one of my favorite. Boots on the ground. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard a politician say that, I would be a rich woman. Um, Department of Homeland Security is a massive, massive organization. Um, they're spread out all over DC. They don't even have their own building yet. I think they're building it right now. So <coughs> as a journalist, it's very difficult to get any kind of information out of them. Um, typically, it takes about two years if you if you file an information request with them. Uh, like I I did holes in the wall in 2008, and I got my documents in 2010. So <laughs> it, they make it incredibly dif difficult to to find out as a journalist what exactly the government is doing. Um, uh, and I'm not even sure they know what they're doing a lot of the time is my experience and having worked in government I can totally believe that that like the different organizations are not always communicating with each other um, and border security is just a huge industry I mean with uh, with uh, the drawdown from Iraq and Afghanistan everybody's looking for the next place where they can make money and the border is one of the places that a lot of like security uh, companies are looking at and um, so uh, so it's in their interest to build up this militarization and the military rhetoric because it, it draws money from for security contracts um, it's also very uh, potent campaign rhetoric for for elections you know uh, but what happens is this erosion of rights for border communities. Uh, border communities become this sort of sacrificial uh, entity for politicians' campaigns and for the huge industrial military border security complex to come down and make, make their money. Um, uh, so 2008 is when the spillover, spillover, I'm sure you've all heard border spillover or vi spillover violence. You've all heard that term. Um, <laughs> here's the picture of Ben Sargent. He's a, a cartoonist. Um, in 2008 is when you really started, or when I really started to remember hearing that, that term spillover, which is the idea that we're going to be run 
over by, uh, you know, like gun battles in the streets and RPGs and stuff like that. And, um, and I mean, I do want to say that I have spent time in, in, in Juarez and in Tamaulipas, and there is a very serious problem going over there, going on over there. There's a huge security crisis. So I'm not saying that that's not happening. I'm just saying that the reasons that are that that's happening, and this is a whole other presentation, uh, have to do with rule of law, uh, judicial, the judicial system not working, corruption in the government. That's why that violence is happening partly there. So we don't have that here. I mean, we don't have the entire police force working for a cartel. We don't have that here. At least not yet. No, <laughs> I don't think we do. <laughs> um, so uh, there's an old newspaper saying, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. And um, that is an unfortunate thing about, about the newspaper business is that violence sells, you know. Um, so people cover the violence because, because it does attract attention and it does sell newspapers and, and, and influential reporters come down from New York Times and they do stories about the violence because that's what their editor, um, you know, assigns and that's what, what sells newspapers. So, uh... At the same time, in 2008, we saw a militarization of the Mexican side of the border also. Um, I think it came a little bit later here in Tamaulipas, but in, in Chihuahua, the military came in in 2008. Um, so there is this conflation, uh, and I think part of it is the limitations of media, is that Right now, we're being told as journalists that nobody wants to read anything more than 140 characters, like Twitter, you know? So it's really hard to explain what's going on along the border in, you know, even like if you're lucky at a daily newspaper if you get 1,000 words. That's considered, like when I worked at the Monitor, 1,000 words was like, oh my God, stop the presses. They're going to give you 1,000 words. So it's really hard to to describe everything that's happening along the border in a thousand words. So that's, right then and there, there's no analysis, there's no context. It's just a crime story. It's like, this happened, and it happened yesterday. And then that's all you get. So we get, I mean, we've been getting stories like that since the violence took off in Mexico. And so people get confused that aren't down here. They think that all these U.S. counties, border counties, are like the same as Mexico that, you know, we're under fire, and, I mean, my father is a ardent Fox News watcher, and <laughs> when I'm in El Paso, he's like, oh, my God, what are you doing there? They're going to kill you. You know, I'm like, Dad, I'm at the mall in El Paso. No, get out of there. Get out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's like, no, it's, it's really, it's fine. Uh, I'm going to the movies. Um, so, but it's hard with the limitations of media. You don't get the space. Uh, to to really explain the differences on the border between the Mexican uh, border county and the U.S. border county, and okay, yeah, it's it's bad there, but it's not that bad here. Uh, so, like I said, it's difficult as a reporter. I mean, I'm lucky because I work for a magazine, and I can I can write like 8,000 words, which is about what it takes to even get into it. <laughs> um, because it is difficult to explain why it's, you know, there's two murders here in a year and, you know, 3,000 on the other side. Um, and again, no one listens to border communities. So when, uh, okay, when the mayor comes out from El Paso or, or, or whatever and says, you know, we've only had one murder here in like two years or something, like everybody thinks he's crazy, you know. Um, Okay, so, yeah, so here's another, like, uh, this is a TV reporter who was on CNN, and this is it back in 2009, you see Mexican drug war spills over, and they're talking about El Paso, and then I love the Mexican violence, it's the Mexican flag with an AK-47 on it, like, somehow they're, like, you know, inherently violent people or something, so, oh, and then Anderson Cooper spill over, <laughs> 
if uh, yeah, if it's really if there's a lot of violence, then Anderson Cooper will show up. No, um, but he never actually went to Juarez. He just stayed in El Paso with Juarez in the background, and he wore this like sort of military style shirt, which I thought was really spiffy. Um, it's funny because you'll see the national, like the famous national journalists, come down and they'll be wearing sort of military attire. I've even seen them in like flak jackets on TV, you know, like wearing. I'm like, really? Okay. Um, so, okay, so I'm wrapping this up. Uh, the latest buzz term is narco terrorists, which um, I find really dangerous. Um, it's very popular, especially with Mike McCall and Congressman Ted Poe, two Republican um, congressmen from Texas, um, because now they're conflating immigration, illegal immigration, terrorism, and the drug war all together into one, you know, nice blood-soaked package. Um, and it especially gets, this kind of rhetoric gets really loud during election years because it attracts people's attention, and it makes them look like they're, they're doing something. Um, <coughs> and also, if you can link them as, as narco-terrorists, it brings more funding from the federal government because then you're fighting the war on terror. It's not just about fighting illegal immigration. It's about fighting the war on terror. So you're, getting, you're, uh, you're, you're ramping up the, the militarization and the funding. And then, as, as, as Miguel talked about, the Ag Commissioner Todd Staples, you know, is running for higher office, so he released his strategic mi military assessment, which he spent $80,000 of taxpayer money on, uh, and he called, they called the U.S. border counties sanitary tactical zones, which I thought was really pretty insulting, where, you know, this would be these sanitized zones where they would use these counties to push back the narco-terrorists, you know, so this would be like kind of like a weird militarized zone. And uh, it's funny because when Rick Perry ran for Ag Commissioner, he talked a lot about Iraq. So I don't know why, but <laughs> when you're running for statewide uh, in Texas, it's really good to talk about terrorism. For some reason, it helps you win your election. Um, and so what next? Here's Ben Sargent's uh, cartoon uh, about a guy coming down to uh, Todd Staples' office, and he's like, oh, are you here for a war on the Mexicans? <laughs> um, you know, just just how ridiculous it is that the Ag Commissioner is even uh, commissioning a, a uh, military assessment in the first place. And uh, that's it. It's already on? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, Gary Mounts, Dr. Mounts in uh, political science. You can hear me all right? Hey, keep it close like this? All right. Like a crooner or an um, yeah. entertainer? Okay. Uh, I'll be very brief. I'll leave most of the time to you all. Professor Etheridge and others, I'm sure, have um, good questions and good comments. Uh, the fact that you're here shows your, your commitment and your interest. Uh, I, f I, uh, I won't single out um, for critique uh, each individual paper. I just found that they formed a whole, W-H-O-L-E, <laughs> not the hole in the wall or the border wall, but a, um, a perfect context for uh, analyzing. And here we are at the university, and I'm real proud of, of UTPA. We, uh, I think it was about five years ago, uh, maybe a year after the Secure Fence Act <coughs> on the border wall started, uh, we had a Pan American um, Days conference, which, by the way, is next week. Um, and uh, the theme of that conference was indeed um, uh, puentes o uh, fronteras, puentes o barreras. 
uh, bridges or, or barriers. So uh, we've, got, we've had a head start on this, and I think this panel and your, your presentations show uh, a continual uh, emphasis in that uh, regard. Uh, we have to just, uh, it, it's overwhelming, and sometimes with the role of the media, not only Fox, but the mainstream media, uh, Dr. Uh, Diaz Barria talked about how uh, actually the more um, centrist uh, publications, National Geographic, et cetera, um, shape the agenda and shape our minds. We're so happy to have the Texas Observer and other alternative um, sources. But um, I see no other way out or no other way to deal with this than just continuing our research and um, combining our forces, the links between the uh, interest groups like the Border Wall Coalition, uh, Valley Interfaith, a variety of, of church and, um, and civic groups and educational groups um, to, to say no and to say that this is not the correct analysis. Um, I, I think we can win, I'm pretty optimistic, but uh, we, have to, we have to be very persistent. But just some quick, quick th things that, I, uh, uh, that, that caught my attention and probably yours too. Um, the, um, the question of the spillover, we've uh, dealt with that, uh, at least in my classes and several other classes and for a number of, of years. Um, I was very proud of my students. Some of them are right here helping out with the conference um, in the politics of Mexico last semester, and they uh, developed a, an altar for Dia de los Muertos, Day of the, the Dead, a very beautiful, uh, famous uh, festival in, in Mexico uh, to honor one's loved ones, and they constructed an altar to the over 50,000 souls um, uh, in, in Mexico that had been um, affected and killed by, by drug and cartel violence with a proper Mexican flag, not a uh, besmirched sacrilegious Mexican flag that we saw in the photos, and with uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe and with uh, pictures of the students who had been killed and others, uh, journalists and others who have uh, sacrificed their life. But um, we, we've paid the price, and, and uh, Dr. Diaz Barriga and others pointed out how uh, the, the patriotism, the service of, of Mexican Americans and others in, in the valley. We're closer to it. We know um, the correct, and maybe not the total analysis, but we know uh, that what they say is wrong, and um, we feel left out. So uh, about that, uh, there's no quick, easy way out uh, except to persist. And uh, I think maybe the comments and the questions that will, that will come now will um, help in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. And so I would ask our panelists to come and sit at the table and we can take some questions. So if you're ready with your question now in the back that you've written down. This is from Canada. <laughs> is it Lee? Yeah. Lee? The question I have is two, two parts. First of all, are there any state laws there similar to Arizona immigration laws? Uh -huh. And then the second question is, do you have ICE immigration custom enforcement raids on businesses more than you used to? So first one, mm -hmm. state law. Any state law immigration laws? Sure, thank you. As far as state laws, I'm not completely sure. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is that um, secure communities um, recently was the in, all of Washington State is now required to participate. Um, so that's one kind of major change. Uh, before there were um, certain law enforcement agencies that had volunteered to participate, but now that it's mandatory, I think that will um, kind of exacerbate what I was already talking about. Um, oh, yeah. So Secure Communities um, is a program, an informa information sharing program, so that when people are arrested and um, apprehended by the police, um, I guess there's kind of a cross database um, where it can be checked with um, 
with I guess USCIS, I, I, the, the whole, the complexities of the institutional <laughs> overlaps, I'm still trying to untangle it all, but um, so basically you can end up in the hands of, um, of ICE, of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and then end up in a detention center. For, exactly, for being arrested, not, and you don't have to be charged with a crime, just the fact that you've come in contact with, with the local police or the sheriff or any sort of law enforcement agency that's participating is how that's working. And the advice, yeah, they are. Um, but I'm not sure, I wasn't particularly looking into ICE for this preliminary research just because I was more focused on the Border Patrol, so I don't think I could give a really conclusi conclusive answer about whether or not those activities have increased recently. Um, well, I'm sure there are, but I, <laughs> I couldn't say the numbers, unfortunately. I mean, the, the detention center in Washington is located in Tacoma, and um, in recent years, the detention center has just grown massively. Um, so I can only imagine that the ICE activities are also increasing. Yeah, thanks for the question. Tenemos eh, la posibilidad de, de responder en español para ustedes, para cualquier persona que tiene pregunta en, en español. Uh, I'll defer to Dr. Díaz Pariga, but I can try. <laughs> o comentario, no importa. Uh, this is regarding the border wall. It's just that I remember when it was first being um, said that it was going to be made, there was a lot of comments of people saying, well, it's not like Mexicans don't know about ladders or things like that. And even now, um, there's always, like, they've found the, the tunnels from Mexico to the U.S., so it just makes... I mean, they're, they're always talking about how the wall protects and it was built to do this. And just thinking about it, does it even do anything? Because it's just there. I, exactly. So. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's largely symbolic. And I think it says more about us than it says about Mexico. Um, it's funny because I, I was recently um, interviewing a, a drug informant who had uh, built one of those tunnels underneath the fence. And he said that they, they <laughs> it's really funny. He said on the Mexican side, they had a fake judicial office where they started the tunnel, and then it came out in the parking lot of immigration enforcement. <laughs> and for the longest time, immigration didn't know about it because they would uh, redo the pavement every time they closed it, and they'd put an oil spot on top of it so you couldn't tell. <laughs> so, I mean, people are way more, uh, have way more ingenuity than a fence will ever have, and fences have never, I mean, we've, throughout history, you know, the Great Wall, the Berlin Wall, We've had fences and they've never worked. So, I mean, I think we already know it doesn't work. <laughs> I just want to draw off the reference to the Berlin Wall. I think uh, a little over 200 people died at the Berlin Wall from roughly the early 60s to 1989. We have easily over from five to some people go up to f yeah, 6,000 deaths here. We know the names of everybody who died at the Berlin Wall. There are websites where you can find out their biographies. There are many people who are dying in the deserts. We don't know their names. They're, uh, they're in some morgue somewhere. So there is an issue, issue here of not only, you know, what is the border wall doing, but how is it helping, how is it helping us refashion, reshape the relationship with Mexico? And I think Dr. Magana put it very well. Is we have roughly half a million undocumented immigrants coming into the U.S. every year, I believe you said. And, you know, this calls for more of a management problem than an attempt at exclusion. And that's going to ultimately lead to increased violence. 
I just wanted to add that if you go to the website for the Coalición de Derechos Humanos, which works in Tucson, Arizona, uh, they keep a record of the names of the names that are known of people who die in that area. So you can go to the website and, and so the, the even the act of naming, right, becomes a, almost an act of resistance uh, because you're actually trying to, to give a name to that person uh, that uh, the, the border is trying to render well disposable as you pointed out today and uh, also invisible so even just putting that name out there becomes a very significant act good afternoon i had uh, two questions it's for the all three board members and um the first one was was there any uh, data from the ucr that was analyzed uh, to determine if it is crime that is occurring here on the border or if it's violence that's directly related to the cartel per se war violence was um, and i'm referring to the uniform crime report as far as that goes and um, the other question goes if uh, it's might be more of an opinion or a belief however you'd like to take it but do you uh, believe that a proactive response should be taken versus a reactive response if there is um, a higher rate of um, violence that is related to the cartels do you believe that should occur instead of a reactive that's a great question um, if you look at local law enforcement the first thing they talk about is keeping corruption out of their police forces. And they understand very well that if the police forces become corrupt, corrupt that the judicial system starts to fail, that's when we're going to be in big trouble. And as you know, the drug cartels have a lot of money, and they are attempting to buy off agents. So local law enforcement is worried about corruption. They want much more monitoring of southbound traffic to keep more guns and money from getting to the cartels. Um, so they and they want more investigators so they have a different set of priorities than this sort of national militaristic approach and how to keep the border secure and they are concerned for keeping it secure your question speaks to the definition of spillover the state of def texas's definition of spillover is basically anything that comes from mexico what that means is that probably any crime that gets committed in texas is spillover because you can connect the dot somehow back to Mexico. The local definition of spillover is a uh, an act planned and carried out by the cartels on US soil. So if you look at their definition, there is very, very little spillover violence. All right, so first you have to break that down. But what's interesting is how the Unified Crime Report falls into that. And even the people with the broad definition of spillover will claim, oh, the Unified Crime Report does not back our argument, reporting does not back our argument because they can't get to the subtleties of how crime is starting in Mexico. So if you buy drugs in Houston and you know three or four, five, links later you can get it down to mexico that's spillover crime spillover violence right according to the state of texas definition but not according to the local uh definition so there's mistrust of the uniform uniform crime reporting data on all sides and how it can be involved in sort of reading uh the need for greater border security anybody else want to comment on that was your second question addressed No, I, I, um, I've told my classes and I, um, I've written about it in uh, wherever I can, you know, talk to people or write. Uh, that problem, and I'm not talking about the conflagration of, of, of all the immigration and, and um, 
racialization and those kinds of questions, but will never uh, end until uh, we stop sending arms to Mexico and until we legalize drugs. Um, there's a lot of disagreement with that, of course, but um, it's, uh, you have liberal columnists, you have conservative columnists, you have a very, very broad range of intellectuals and others who now have come to that conclusion. Um, politicos or candidates, as we know, can't say that. Uh, they'll be dead in their tracks. I don't mean literally, but um, uh, they won't win re-election, yes. Um, so, but barring that, we have to find other, as you say, uh, proactive, um, temporary, partial solutions. No, I was just uh, just curious because of the report from the generals and the intent uh, of what the report was. If it was more to uh, towards a proactive response um, and versus a reactive, so that was the basis for my question. just uh, curious because recently there was a report that one of the candidates th that was here from the Valley, I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Maldonado. He was running for constable. And it was discovered that he had ties with the drug cartels. In fact, he was transporting, um, I believe it was a million dollars from one of the northern states to Texas and he was detained here in Texas. And I'm just s curious to know what the probability is that we currently have officials that are just as connected to the cartels as he could have been because he was he was in election for constable. And what effect that could have on on the valley. Everything is partial, right? <laughs> um, I think that kind of thing, petty or, or large scale uh, corruption, I is also probably con to be continued and inevitable uh, with, the, uh, with the poverty. This, these are the two poorest SMSAs in the nation. Uh, you might say Cameron and Hidalgo. And um, until there's greater economic development and more attention there, you'll always have uh, people lured by the um, by the temptation of easy money, quick money, and as has been pointed out, the you know the, the fabulous sums uh, that the cartels have. So uh, I don't see uh, any way there for Mexico or for ourselves um, than um, working on economic development, um, uh, jobs. It sounds simple. It sounds corny, but um, alternatives uh, in the area of education, in the areas of health, in in, in all kinds of uh, areas um, to deal with that, to, to provide alternatives for people who might be desperate and might turn to um, illegal sources of funding. Um, uh, having, having worked in politics for a while too, I think, I think for politicians it's much more difficult for them to talk about corruption or the judicial system or, or things that take a long time and require a lot of civic uh, building. Um, they're working in two-year cycles. They want to get reelected in two years or four years, so they're looking for something quick, like a fence that, you know, you there it is. You see it? It was built like this, and we spent this much money on it. And unfortunately, the political rhetoric and, and the way the system is, they don't allow you know, you know, uh, a deeper conversation about what really needs to happen to actually fix the problem. And uh, that happens a lot in the media, too, is the narrative is very simple. It's, you know, three, you get three minutes on TV, you get a hundred, you get a thousand or eight hundred words in a newspaper, and you never get past that, which there needs to be a deeper, longer 
conversation and they actually need to pay attention in DC because I mean you saw Congressman Cuellar trying to get his point across with the generals and the way that it was put across by by Fox News it's hard even for the congressional leaders from the border I think to to pierce that narrative that bubble in DC where they just think this is some kind of war zone well you know just consider this the chief of police of, of McAllen or whoever, be proactive, says, look, our, our law enforcement is working. We want more investigative capabilities, and we want to make sure that we're keeping corruption out of our force, and we need help with that, right? That gets no play. If he would get on anywhere and talk about spillover violence, I'm pretty sure we'd have Fox News, New York Times, and everybody else down here in a minute. So... Anderson Cooper. So, yeah, I, you know, I think that, I think I, I, I think I agree with that assessment. Corruption's a huge, it's going to be increasingly a bigger problem. Um, just, what are your thoughts about how these ideas of the border are sort of normalized here within the valley? Because we've been talking about on a national level, but what about those same mindsets that are carried by people here as well, right? Um, we, we watch the same media, we watch the same news, so those kinds of images also become very normalized here. And uh, um, just as an example, uh, yesterday there was this tragic accident where uh, an Astro van flipped over and about, I think, 15 plus people lost their lives in it. And this morning, when I was listening to the radio, uh, somebody, one of the disc jockeys, having to mention that, oh, well, you know, yeah, it's sad, but, you know, a lot of these undocumented people, well, they said illegals, I choose to say undocumented, but, you know, a lot of these illegals um, just come and end up benefiting from the work that everybody else does. So that, to me, was a big red flag in itself. And I'd like to hear what you all's comments are in terms of that. So the van was carrying undocumented? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Was it a local station, or was it like a, what was the? So it was a local? Uh huh. It was radio. Cause yeah, because okay, because what's happening a lot with radio and media is that it gets taken over by a national entity, and they try to make it seem like it's a local station. You know, like they have this local veneer, but they they tell you sort of like what the agenda will be and stuff. I know there was a big battle here between like Tejano and Conjunto, right? <laughs> Where they uh, some like national radio came in and got rid of the the Conjunto station. Um, so, you know, things like that are, I mean, media is a mess right now. So <laughs> I think it's going to get better. But uh, you really have to question any media that you take in. No, you're absolutely right. There is a lot of, uh, and I'm not sure I would use the word internalization. Um, that's something I'm really trying to think about. Uh, I do know, and I've been at sort of congressional testimony where uh, residents from the valley would express their opposition to the border wall but felt compelled to spend at least five minutes talking about the various branches of the military they had served in, um, just, just to sort of demonstrate their citizenship and allegiance to the nation before then they, you know, so that they, they knew that they did not want to be sort of marginalized. And so I think we have internalized a lot of that. And we do feel this extra need to, if I can use the royal we here, to demonstrate allegiances, to, to demonstrate that we're rational, you know, that we're not Henry Cuellar going, General, did you do this? You know? And, uh, and also, um, you know, we, we can't deny the, the role of the media. I mean, 
every time I go into, and, and maybe, maybe it's wrong of me to think this, or do this, I'm sorry, but if, if I go someplace and they're playing Fox News, I, I try and engage the owner and ask them to change it. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that would be the biggest help right now to this problem. So when you say you wouldn't use the word internalization, you mean because it's already, there isn't an external and an internal. It's already part of the, yeah. So you had a question here? Oh, okay. Rocio. Real quick, and I don't know if it's quick, but um, uh, if you have any insights as to how it is that these corporations are influencing uh, legislation. Obviously, they're getting the contracts. Obviously, they're much more permanent than Congress people. Um, and uh, are there any, I mean, Boeing is, you know, and all of them, they're profiteering. I mean, it's, it's, this is a huge business. But do, do they have a lobbying? Can we track that? Uh, how does that look in D.C. on the ground? I don't know if you know any about anything about that. And I have questions for both of you, but I think we're running out of time. So we'll do this after. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to a Homeland Security conference, you should go because it, it's pretty amazing. They're selling drones. They're selling everything. I mean, it's just a massive industry, and you can find out a lot by going to these conferences. And uh, the, the, con the, the contracts that are granted are not very transparent. Like I said, it's very hard to get uh, documents about contracts. Um, it takes a long time. I think there was a story just came out this, that the statesman and somebody else did about uh, General Abrams uh, being involved. Uh, they outsourced the the border security. Texas did to General Abram, Abrams' uh, um, private consulting firm. You know, so these generals that they got the military assessment from that the Ag Commissioner commissioned were also have been involved in in uh, they all. It's very common for retired generals and so forth to have their own security consulting firms and they consult with different agencies and law enforcement. So it's a big revolving door. So yeah, but yeah, there are, there are ways to track it. It just takes time and it's a huge, huge industry and it's just totally booming right now. Like how many people here hear about uh, BC Bud? Well, <laughs> Canadian, right? Like one of the most important exports from the province in which we live in Canada is marijuana to the United States. Like how many people hear about that every day here? There's tunnels, right? It's all the same. I don't mean it's all the same. There are similar dynamics at work. And yet, do you read about it in your paper? Do you read about Canadian pot as a threat to the US? Like, I think it's really interesting to think about the different ways that these things uh, come into play in the media as a way of reproducing this border between the US and Mexico, right? And I think that's why Lee's work on the Canadian border is, is so important because it shows us that difference and the way, and yet the way in which those Latinos working there are now bringing this border, or not them, but the, but the sort of criminalization of them and, and the, the need to sort of, or the, the, the apparent need to, or the perceived need to call the Border Patrol because they're perceived as not speaking English. The Border Patrol becomes the translator, right? I think this is a really important moment where this border is, is coming into being through these particular bodies. And, yeah, it's like something we should all be sort of worrying about. And I don't know what time it is, but Alex has a question. It's time. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I think that that's further exemplified for the narrative on the piece, oh, on the piece arch where it says from the common mother, right? Like that's how the border is conceptualized up there as like, you know, a reproduction of like the British, I guess, or like the Euro, uh, yeah, whiteness. So, I mean, that's all I want. Is that an arch down here? Like, yeah. I know. <laughs> Well, yeah, the Friendship Park in, in San Diego, they built a fence through it. So no more friendship there. Well, I want to thank everybody and a big round of applause for our panelists.
Thank you all for sharing and thank you for your questions.